Uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us uh, for our NEC Summer Series. Uh, I am really uh, fortunate today and very privileged to be joined by three uh, quite incredible faculty members from NEC. Um, uh, Ian Howell, who uh, is obviously a member of our voice faculty, um, who directs the graduate uh, vocal pedagogy program, teaches studio voice, um, and also uh, coaches students in Baroque vocal rep, uh, and also, as you will hear in a moment, has technological prowess uh, beyond what is uh, what one would expect from that from that bio. <laughs> uh, Nick Kitchen has taught at NEC since 1992. Nick, I believe, um, a member of our violin faculty, also uh, violinist with Borromeo String Quartet, String Quartet in Resonance, as well as uh, being the artistic director of the Heifetz Institute. Um, and Mary Peckham, uh, who is an old colleague of mine uh, from our pre-NEC days, but she, pre she predates me at NEC, um, long time uh, performer, cellist, educator, um, the chair of the college chamber music program at NEC, uh, obviously leading that as well as working with our prep program and the director of the chamber music workshop at the um, Perlman music program. So, uh, so, Really thrilled that you're all here. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Um, really wanted to put the three of you together because um, as you will remember, it feels like ages and ages and ages, it feels like a lifetime ago now. We moved to an online platform quite abruptly yeah. uh, uh, in March. And uh, you know that's, that's not a sort of natural thing for a conservatory to do, particularly to do quickly, and particularly with everybody scattered, which was something that we sort of weren't prepared for is to be able to do this in a way with everybody in distant places so it was a very extreme moment and i'm curious if you know you guys just jumped in and dealt with this with incredible creativity and ingenuity and really seized the moment so i'd love to hear from each of you about you know what was in your head in that moment um and how just talk a little bit about your work since then and how you turned that real challenge into the opportunity that each of you has has created. Um, and Mary, maybe we'll start with you because chamber music is not the obvious thing that we think is going to work in a, in a socially distanced, technologically dispersed way. So. It's so true. It, it was, um, you know, at first I, I, I think at March 12th was my last day of live teaching at NEC. And then it became, you know, pretty obvious that we were going to make this transition and we had a couple weeks to do it. And NEC being the place that it is, uh, the, the other faculty members on the chamber music faculty were incredibly creative and willing to try anything to stay connected and provide something educationally meaningful to the chamber music groups. Uh, Nick Kitchen was a big part of that and, and now Ian is going to be a part of it too. But um, so, you know, we found that, that we all had to suddenly transition uh, you know, I who had never even heard of Zoom before became like Zoom virtuoso queen. Like, you know, how many meetings can I set up in like 30 seconds? And uh, it, so it became a new world. And we found initially it was just important to connect. And then eventually to create, we actually all created projects with our groups that we thought would keep them stimulated and motivated to stay connected and to keep trying to develop or evolve in their chamber music studies. So half of them were research-based, half of them were trying to layer their parts together and, and create some sort of collaborative musical entity, whether it was mostly audio but some video. And uh, we've been learning along the way. So I, I don't know, you know, I, unlike uh, Ian and Nick, was not so technologically savvy but really felt kind of inspired by the adventure of the new gadgets. So right away I ordered <laughs> mics and an interface and started trying all the popular apps that I'd been seeing people use before and realized that to get you know the quality that we're used to at NEC in our in our small ensemble uh, performance practice it was going to take a real turnaround in our approach to it so I went from creating sensuous live musical sound experience to how do we build music together layer by layer and I think that one thing we've discovered is it's taken us to this place of a different kind of deep listening and also a, a new uh, adventure kind of creatively. And uh, it's, it's truly amazing 
to be at NEC working with people like who, who you see on the screen, screen, including you, Andrea, who are so willing to be pioneers and move forward and you know, s still stay connected and help everyone like learn through music because that's, that's the essential right there is our music. We still, it, it, it's everything to all of us, I think. Anyway, sorry, I went off on a tangent. Right. No, no, that's a, a perfect tangent. Um, actually, you know, there are so many terms that we've all, not just Zoom, but so many terms that now just sort of crept into our, into our lexicon. I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about layering. And so uh, we've all seen different compilations, but what's, what's the layering distinction? Yeah, if you're asking me, I would automatically defer to Nick because I learned what I, how I went about doing it from Nick. I initially started out on my own with some apps that were pretty intuitive and easy to use. However, I had to deal with things like latency and I am not going to try to describe what latency is because these guys are amazing. Uh, Nick, could I just hand it off to you? Could you talk about all the processes you've been through with the layering? It's brilliant. Well, with, with pleasure. I, um, uh, maybe I, I, it, it, that, that kind of causes me to explain a little bit, if it's okay, Andrea, about what I'm in the middle of now with the Heifetz Institute, the Heifetz International Music Institute. Um, uh, well, just to put it in a frame, uh, this was a surprising thing. We have a member of our board who is an epidemiologist, and he talked to us in January, and he said, you know, I'm so excited what you've set up for the summer. I'm sorry I won't be attending any of the concerts. <laughs> And uh, we kind of knew, oh, gee, something is coming that we're going to find out what this is all about. And uh, we decided to take the whole institute, at least as much as we could, online. And uh, we've done that. So now there are 150 brilliant faculty members, uh, many from NEC, by the way, and, uh, and students, young artists who are coordinating um, over the globe, as, as NEC did during the, the uh, sort of last part of the semester. But to get to the layering, uh, one crucial thing was we, we were pretty sure that we could sustain people's solo lessons in a way that could be meaningful and, and certain kind of interactions that work reasonably well in this format that we're in right now. I mean, there, there are problems this way or that way, but basically you can do it. But you cannot play together. Um, maybe explain, uh, putting this in perspective and the recording will catch it. Can I lead you in clapping? Well, I'm just going to count to sure. three. Let's Great. clap. Okay, ready? So one, two, three. That's not going to work too well for chamber music. Um, and so, uh, but what I did do, and this was a, this was a philosophical decision. And this is what, um, this is what Mary, I think, is referring to. I decided myself, okay, I've got to test out, is there some way that we can do this that really makes chamber music meaningful? And uh, there are different ways, and we'll get into some of those later, and there, 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 there are different ways to look at the toolkit. But one of them, and the one that people are right now doing, and they're in the middle of movements doing this, and I'm really excited about it, is that you uh, use a, um, a audio program, DAW, they call them Digital Audio Workstation, and there are many forms. Mac computers all have GarageBand, which is a pretty good one. Um, and basically, one person puts down a part of a phrase, and then they send it to the other person uh, as a file, and there's little details. They compress it so it stays the complex file that you made. And uh, then if you're taking headphones and you're listening to what that other person did, and I find you have to put one off and one on, then you play with them. And you may find the first time you sort of miss it a little bit, and the second time you do it a little better, and you can start to hear their intonation, and you can start to hear their breathing, and you can start to hear their phrasing, and you can start to actually try to interject into the phrase. Well, I think I'm describing to you what was crucial about those experiments, because I realized that not only did you have to study the score to figure out how to construct a movement in a logical way, uh, then once you're doing it, you have to listen very, very carefully to really be with the other person. And I did a movement myself that is kind of a demo online for that people can listen to. It's of the Dvorak Terzetto, because I could play all the parts, uh, two violins and viola. And, um, and, and it made me conclude, yeah, you know, um, 
we want to be in one room together. That's what we're used to. That's what we count on. But this is actually going to make people not only learn the music in a new way, because it's going to force them to study it for different reasons and see different things in it. Um, it's going to force them to listen very, very well. And it's going to teach them all sorts of things about how to use the computer that they are in front of for so much of their life. But uh, frankly, most of these items of manipulating a DAW and layering things, and by the way, one of the crucial parts of that, and I, I'm kind of talking in the weeds, but these things are kind of crucial, is that each person, each part has two tracks. And that way they can play right up to a certain point in the music, their colleagues play with them, and by activating the other track, they can make a totally smooth transition uh, where the music transfers. And in this way, and it, it's amazing to me, I, there are now 100 students at the Heifetz Institute. There are 20 chamber music groups, and they are all doing this on Windows platforms and iPads and phones and uh, you name it, uh, and, and, and MacBooks. And um, I, I do have heard one or two groups where they are they are really totally freaked out and they're not doing very well. Um, and we're gonna help them. And I want them at least to get a short section of music done because I know they'll learn so much from that. But frankly, there's about, I don't know, eight or nine other groups that have just started to run with it and they're just off and going. And uh, it sounds beautiful. I've heard some of the takes already and um, they're doing a great job. So, so, you know, these are, this is one way to, there, there, there are so many ways to approach the, the, the issue. Um, and we're going to get into some of those, which is the, is the attempt to actually bridge that uh, delay gap that we discovered by our clapping. But um, what does excite me about the layered um, technique is it actually is a very high sensitivity uh, form of listening. And I feel very confident that the students are going to learn to listen better in many ways than they ever had to before. Yeah, that's a really exciting moment. I, I remember it being a very hopeful moment when you sent uh, you sent me that that mm -hmm. first recording because it, I felt a little bit like getting the first phone call or the first you know the first flight. Uh, it was you know we were so aware of what what we didn't have by being together. You know you so take for granted the ease of being together. Um, and I think we think of musicians as being in small rooms by themselves and really used to that. But so much more of our work is together um, and playing together. And, and so uh, that was just a real moment of hope uh, because it wasn't, a, it wasn't a compiled thing. It was, a, it was actually sort of created together in a, in a weird way, a uh, different way, not weird anymore. <laughs> but, the, but the issues of, so I also remember early on in this, um, you know, the whole issues of lag and latency were issues that words, again, that suddenly were very present in our um, in our uh, speaking. And I remember calling up a, a technological guru and saying, what can we do in this area? And lo and behold, uh, we actually had somebody on our faculty who was the leading person uh, really dealing with these issues. Um, and that's you, Ian. So maybe you can tell us um, about your work and, and how this is all sure. unfolded and how it yeah. intersects. I gosh, I don't know if I'm if I'm leading anything, but I'm, it's certainly consuming a lot of my time. I'll say that. Um, yeah, Thanks. I'd love to. I mean, even even just bouncing off what Mary and 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 Nick were saying, I think really well. It's like this this entire slow burn crisis has had really different flavors at different times. And like, I had the same experience that Mary had, you know, it's like, March 12th was actually my birthday, like I turned 45, and then the world ended, you know, and like, I went home and, and never left. Um, and I think that there was a, there was a like a trauma that everybody experienced in that, that nobody had the tools to deal with. And, um, and, you know, just for anybody on a college faculty, anybody with a private studio, like, I just, I want to honor that everybody stuck with it and that everybody kept showing yes. up and kept participating and, and kept being, you know, strong for their students, but also showed their weakness for their students and, you know, modeled what it is to grieve. Um, and I think for a while, that's all we could really do. You know, all we could really, like Mary has showed me these pictures of her, of her 
chamber music kids, you know, and it's like just the act of getting up on the Zoom screen was like the ministry that she had for these people, right, in their lives. Right. Um, and then I, I think pretty soon some people got to work, you know, some serious people started thinking about how it is we can, we can first identify the issues, because as, as Mary and Nick said, it's like we're most musicians who teach at the academic in an academic setting, we're thrown into the just basic common realities of video conferencing, right? And and so there's a steep learning curve. And um, the, the there's this great video, I, I assume everybody has seen it, but it's like a, a choir director tried to record the Hallelujah Chorus on Zoom, like having not tried it before. <laughs> and he was like, da, da, and it was like, kuh, 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 and it was, you know, it was terrible, right? Um, so Fortunately, we have serious people on our faculty, and we have serious people that all of us work with. And it was the Hakaluya chorus. It was the Hakaluya chorus. That's the Hakaluya chorus. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I think people people just got to work, and and I think we're really fortunate that we have um, a lot of those people within our community. Um, and so we started addressing a lot of issues. Honestly, the delay, the was not even the first thing that we had to start working on. The first thing we had to start working on was just like basic audio quality. Like what 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 is it like to go onto a platform that is designed for a Fortune 500 company's boardroom where what matters is intelligibility of speech and all of a sudden, you know, gosh, violins make sounds that fall outside the spectrum of a spoke, speaking voice, right? Singing voices certainly do. Piccolos, my God. You want to try playing a snare drum through Zoom? It's, it's, it's a terrible experience, right? Because the tool is not right. It's not the right tool. Um, so initially, we, we just started working on sound quality. And I think we found some really good novel solutions. There's obviously probably everybody watching this is familiar with the turn on original sound within Zoom. But even beyond that, you know, the, the studio recording uh, industry has solved this, you know, decades ago um, with dedicated um, delicate, dedicated telephone lines. And you can have reasonably, well, reasonably low latency. It's not low enough to perform, but you can have full spectrum sound that is broadcast multi-directionally simultaneously, right? That's, that's within reach. And anybody who's watching who wants to try it, I'd say, like, it's not that these are the only ones, these are just the ones I like, but go look at Clean Feed as a product. It's amazing. Go look at Source Connect now. It's amazing. You'll you'll talk to somebody, you'll have a lesson with somebody, and it's like you didn't realize you had Zoom wax in your ears, or you didn't realize you had Skype wax in your ears that you pull out, right? So like solving the just the basic audio quality is the first problem. And and then we set about to latency. Um I think one of the reasons that one of the reasons that we've kind of found a success uh, with addressing some of the latency and lag issues within a music school um, is I, I think fundamentally like musicians are just good at seeking out other people and trying to have communion with them. Like we're good at talking to other people and we're good at trying to figure out what's interesting about what they do versus what they do. Um, and low latency communications platforms are, you know, in theory, they're decades old, right? And in practice, we're talking about, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe the last 12 to 20 years, there's been like public demonstrations of these things. Um, but, you know, these worlds are siloed. The network engineers are over here and the musicians are over here and they don't go to the same dinner parties. And so there just wasn't enough cross pollination for it to be widely known. Um, so we, we set about investigating a number of uh, the solutions that are out there uh, just to solve the, the fundamental problem, which is that, um, we don't think about it this way. Information occupies real physical space. Like as it travels, information occupies real space. And if you think about being in a room with one another, so let's say you're in a 12 by 12 practice room with a string quartet. Um, if each player is several feet distant from the other, there is actually a delay inherent to sound vibrating through air, right? And we don't have a problem imagining that. We, we account for it. That's how we know where things are in space. Um, so air has a latency, air has a delay that's built in. Um, so when sound travels across the internet, you, you essentially have a few problems, right? The, the first problem is like everybody has something like this. Everybody has an audio interface of some sort. And it takes some amount of time for that device 
to turn the acoustic signal into a digital signal, right? So that's a limitation. Then you have to have a computer and the computer has to move at a certain speed. Then you have to have a, a network and the network has to move at a certain speed. And these challenges are sufficient that like the consumer internet is not, it's not really built for that. Like most of our communication just assumes we can't solve the latency. So it's just really brilliant network engineers who, who work this out and there are specific protocols you can use. So most of the internet goes over one kind of very safe, very clean protocol. It's called TCP for anybody who wants to go to Wikipedia and learn a little bit about it. Um, but there are actually other protocols. So there's one called UDP. And so if TCP is like safe and this computer says hi to this computer, so you know you found it and then they send information and it's very secure. UDP is like a Ferrari with like a crazy monkey driving it. It's just, <laughs> it is so fast and it is very sloppy and you never actually know if all the data got there, right? Um, until you hear it on the other side, essentially. Um, but actually that is perfect for trying to transfer data quickly. <laughs> um, so there are these platforms that are built on essentially just this other way to send information over the internet. Um, and we just got to work exploring it. Nick's been really great helping out with this. Um, there are a number of limitations that I feel like we have essentially, um, we have overcome, which is just to say we know what equipment to use and not use. That's really, that's really what the challenge was. Um, you know, once you know how to use it, you open one program and press three buttons and go basically. Um, but it really matters what you plugged into the computer and it really matters what your computer can do. Um, and uh, honestly, one of the exciting things, because I, I, you know, I know that NEC has a has a, a strong mission to be able to reach, you know, uh, people of a number of different sort of socioeconomic realities, and we have a strong mission within our um, community partnerships program. Um, we have a strong mission to be able to send our students out into the world to teach, right? Um, and so it's actually really exciting. We've been working with a, a German company that makes these like super cheap little Raspberry Pi computers. It's it's like the the computer that your kid is learning how to play Minecraft on. <laughs> like you can actually soup it up and use it to to transmit information over the internet. Um, and so I'd love to play a little sample of this just to make it tangible for people. Um, yeah, please. Great. Okay, so I'm going to switch out. Um, and just by means of setting this up for the people watching at home, we kind of have two issues. The first is the, the audio latency, and, and we're using a platform called SoundJack. It's not the only one out there. I think it is really good at what it does. Um, and again, you can use these very affordable little microcomputers uh, to use it. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, we want to be able to see each other when we perform not just hear each other. Like we're not, we're not training to be radio musicians, we're training to be musicians on stages and in spaces with each other. Um, so we did a, a lot of research about um, essentially what is the fastest that we can get stable multi-directional video. So the video that I'm gonna show you uh, uses a, a platform based on a, it's an open source system called WebRTC, and there's a number of implementations of it. We're using one specific one called Jitsi Meet, so you're going to see the little Jitsi icon up in the corner. Um, we are just using it for the video, and we're using it for the video because it's another one of these programs that just sends my data directly to my pianist's computer, and my pianist's computer sends the data directly to me. So we're cutting out the connection of a server like Zoom is using right now, which is one of those big reasons we had the clap test that didn't go so well. So we have great audio that is like a bowl in a china shop that is shooting from one computer directly to the other, avoiding um, avoiding large parts of the, the internet infrastructure by not using servers. And we're, again, we're just shooting this video directly back and forth. This was, I think we were 16 or 20 miles away within the Boston metro area. This is my living room and this is my collaborator Chelsea's living room and I'll just play um, maybe a minute and a half of this. Flow my tears fall from the springs Let me mourn where night's blackbird, her sad in 
for me seems Then let me live Down a vain light shine you no more. So you hear that you're able to preserve spontaneity, there's interaction, there's cueing, right? And all these things are happening just in real time. Right. So it's it's a really it's a really wild time there, there are systems right now that are like, you know, hugely expensive and site specific that require you to invest in something called Internet 2, which is great. And, you know, uh, we should get eventually, I'm sure. But but, you know, it's it's there are conservatories all over Europe right now that have beautiful, expensive systems requiring Internet 2 and the students aren't allowed to go into the rooms to use it, um, you know, versus. You can do it in your den. You can do it in your bedroom, um, and be able to to connect again. And and I have to tell you, like, I, I don't think it'll surprise anybody watching. As I've been setting people up on this and getting their systems optimized and getting them to a, a real real time audio experience, the most common response is they weep. You know, they just they cry openly over over Zoom, <laughs> right? Be, because because they realize what part of them had been missing. Um, so this is what we've been working on. This is this is one of a number of solutions that I think we're going to be using as an institution to to preserve the connection that I think is really at the center of, of music making and at the center of our mission. Yeah, um, and it's been great to have all of you uh, doing this work in different ways to be able to think about how this pull, we pull this together. I, I was going to ask actually Nick briefly, you know, you have been so engaged with technology anyway, you've so embraced it um, in so many ways in your work. Um, I'm, you know, I guess the question was as a quartet player, as a chamber music player, how, you know, what's the meaningful, how is meaningful performance? Um, how, how is it now? Is meaningful performance possible um, in that way? Um, and and then I guess um, Mary, Andy, and all of you, the, the question is sort of, what do we take from this? We have an emergency moment. These are responses to an emergency moment. We're gonna have a little more control in the fall, as you say, because we'll be able to have, we're more prepared and we can set up our spaces better for this. But what are the lessons that we take forward as an institution and as individual musicians and the things that our students um, are going to be able to pick up and move forward? Well. Can I just jump in with one thought? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I happen to be very lucky. I play on an absolutely gorgeous treasure of an instrument, uh, Guaneri Del Gesù, that was my former teacher, Shimon Goldberg. I, I'm so lucky. Um, at the same time, when many of my students uh, are looking at instruments, I'm very much trying to say, look, get the best instrument you can. and instantly forget about it. Use whatever you have and do the best with it. Make it beautiful. Um, and I think, you know, you, you were just hearing us talk about, I mean, one method we didn't talk about just now, which I know a lot of teachers are doing. A lot of teachers are saying to their students, you know, make, make the best recording you can of that piece and send it to me. And we're not, we're not gonna be doing it at the same time. We're gonna listen closely to it together. You listen to it, I listen to it. Well, the student, by the way, learns a huge amount from that listening. That is no easy experience to come face to face with what is on that tape um, or ear to ear or whatever we wanna say. Um, and then the, and then the, the faculty, the, the teacher will um, go into detail and they can listen to it together which is actually something we never are able to do in a lesson. So oddly, this is a, a wonderful and new resource that is caused by this um, terrible kind of challenge that we have to deal with. Um, and the only, you know, I, I'm, why I'm bringing that up, so, so those are the spectrums. There's the ability to, to massage the technology where you actually can interact in real time as Ian just showed so beautifully. And then there's this, the total opposite, where you're, you're just in a completely asynchronous world, 
but you can go into great and gorgeous detail in how you communicate about it. And then there's everything in between. And I think as, as you're hearing, Ian just said it, and I think we're all kind of saying this, we have to use every single one of those and every one that we can get our hands on. And, and not only that, whichever one we're dealing with at the moment, I think what, what we want to inspire in the students is, and, and in ourselves, is the optimism and the determination that we're not going to be defined by whatever the limits of the platform that we're using, that we are going to make music. And, you know, I have to say, like, I saw a performance in our institute two nights ago. It was a Bubakar Diallo and, and Yun Lee was on the piano. And, you know, they're in um, Cleveland and, um, uh, no, Rochester, I'm sorry, Rochester and uh, um, New York. Uh, and they played this beautiful, beautiful uh, Beethoven sonata um, by recording it in these layers. And, I mean, it was really touching. And I'm like, wow, that's really amazing. And, um, uh, and, and I was very moved, you know, the way I want to be when I hear a beautiful concert. And I'm, of course, watching it on my computer. Um, now, would I like to be back in Jordan Hall and listening to beautiful play? Of course, but, um, uh, uh, well, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, all I'm saying is that, that it's remarkable to me once we once we accept those limitations, we discover that we can very nearly do what we set out to do before. It's just that we have to allow our creativity to build a new path. And uh, I think we've all noticed that we we suffer from those uh, limitations, but we're also learning from them uh, in in a great degree. And I think that goes for every person I know that they feel that mi that odd mixture uh, from this crisis. Mary, any any thoughts from your perspective? Well, you know, uh, I love everything that everybody is saying here, and I'm finding it incredibly inspiring. Thanks, you guys. Um, which always happens even when we just talk, you know. But I. Um, I, I have I have felt like I have learned, and I think students are learning. There's a certain kind of uh, deep preparation <laughs> that one can do on these platforms, so that when you get to when we get to the live rehearsal or performance experience, I think we may be well, we'll certainly appreciate it in a different way, but we may be able to prepare in a much deeper fashion than we ever have before. And I know that that's something that I look forward to using in every curriculum from this day forward, no matter what happens. I also feel that we have discovered that you may work on a piece of chamber music and you know, at the, the biggest hall you might play in where it's appropriate, you'll play for maybe a thousand people. But if, you, if you're able to get a, a wonderful representation that you can put online of your performance, you can reach a hundred times that many people. And I think that we are learning that we can, you know, as, as technology throughout time has helped our art, you know, uh, this is one of those times I think we can find more ways to, again, the connecting, this is very intimate. We're in our own little Brady Bunch TV show. We're able to talk to each other. And when we talk to each other, it feels even more intimate, maybe than a lecture hall. So we can do all that before we even play a note in person. So I look forward to that. Yeah, what I'm hearing from each of you is sort of um, moving past the kind of um, sort of, well, trauma, I guess, is, as you talked about it, Ian, but the sort of sense of loss into what's inherent in this moment um, and how do we recreate what's precious. Um, and as you say, it really amplifies the beauty and the simplicity, the ease of being together, but now a deeper listening. But Ian, I know we've talked about this too. I'm just mindful um, from my perspective that online is now a stage we have to prepare our students to perform on, but it's a different stage. Um, it has different technology and it has different things in it. And I wonder if you could just, if you have, if you wanna share some of your thoughts about how we might do that better. Yeah, for sure. Um... I mean, I think in in broad terms, there's there's a cultural shift that is obligatory from this. 
And if if we take a little bit of a historical lens, so you know, this is the advantage of going to music school, right? You 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 learn about the the past of music, right? Um, you know, Mary's right. Technology has intersected with music for you know not just since the nineteen seventies, but technology has intersected with music since you know uh, you know music boxes in the seventeenth century, and you know since the invention of the telegraph in the nineteenth century, and since the you know the advent of the telephone, and then the radio, and 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 you know we we all think that youtube is this amazing thing and like that was dreamed up by a 19th century utopian fiction writer you know it's like these these I, fundamental ideas that humans yearn to be able to transmit their thoughts faster than their bodies can be moved is like deep and connected to what it is to be a human being um so i think you know first of all that this moment that is taking place right now i feel like you know despite the fact that, you know, YouTube existed before, you could upload, you know, pre-broadcasted things. And then YouTube got to the point where you could live stream things. You can obviously live stream things on Facebook, and that's certainly interesting. But, you know, the thought that you could do either assembled performances with some element of, of live timing to them, or that you could do um, distributed performances, so in real time, but people in, in different areas, is actually, it's a radical step forward because it's being embraced by practitioners of music. So the, the way that I kind of frame it, and this is the little analogy that helps me, is like my mom to the end of her life could not get the VCR to stop going 12, 12, 12. And right, and like some of our viewers are gonna have to go look up what a VCR was, right? So, um, so it, like there is this sense that technology is actually, it's really a generational experience. And so we we have in our in our preparatory division we we have like some real forward thinking people who even ahead of us starting in the fall um, have gotten you know groups of teenagers playing in jazz combos in real time on low latency platforms right so we have a number of faculty members David Zofer is really leading the charge on this and I think it's so amazing and and like if I just take a second and imagine I'm 13 and I like to play the jazz trombone and I now have a chance instead of being stuck in my house and not being able to do anything I can now improvise on a weekly basis with a small group of my friends for that 13 year old that was never not possible they've always been able to do that in their life we're gonna to talk to them when they're 50 and by the time they get to 50 their life will have been not uniquely guided by but that is going to be a core principle of their music making is that if they want to they can call up their friend in cleveland and call up their friend in pittsburgh and whatever and make music together in real time so a little bit i think it's great that we are imagining how all of this technology will unfold and that we are imagining what it is to be a stage um in 2020 like uh, to use a digital platform as a stage but honestly i th i think people younger than all of us are going to teach us how to use this like we're going to teach them how to make it go and i think they're going to show us what to do with it yeah that's that's great and i i am um really again mindful with each of you i mean talk about uh, never letting a crisis go to waste what i you know just so appreciated with each of you is that you've used this moment, eked out every bit of learning in it to deepen the palette that we had that existed, right? To deepen our listening and our acoustic work and the, the deep artistry um, and to expand the palette into these digital ways, but then also to move above each of that and think about what does it mean to be an artist? What does it mean to be a musician? What does it mean to share music uh, with an audience, with each other? Uh, what does it mean to truly communicate, which is what we're all after, to have an impact on people. Um, and so the fact that you all are capable of making the tech work in a productive way and using it in really creative moments, um, that has been such a lifeline for our students as well as for all of us, um, but also to really um, transcend the logistics of that and think about artistry. Um, and the development of artistry is uh, is just a wonderful thing to watch, incredibly inspiring from my perspective. I know for all of your colleagues and, and the students who get to work with you. So thank you very much. Keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, we will facilitate your work in every way we can, but really look forward to, uh, to sharing with you in person and digitally um, in the future. So please take care. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea.